Hi, everyone, and welcome to Teacher Stories. This is your host, Ken Federnick. Today's episode is another in a series we are running on a question that has important implications for teachers, school administrators, parents, and, and well, for all Americans, really. And that question is, what can schools do to help save our democracy? That question presupposes that our democracy is in jeopardy. And if you're wondering whether that's true, consider this. A recent CNN poll found that 90% of Americans believe that democracy is either being tested or is already under attack. So thus far, we have posted uh, episodes about character education, civic education, and restrictions on what teachers can say and do in the classroom. And we also will be posting soon another episode on how inadequate and unequal funding of our public schools in most parts of the country also threatens our democracy. You will find all of these episodes at teacherstories.org and on most podcasting platforms. Our topic today is on the current state of social studies education in public schools and on the teaching of history in particular. A growing number of states like Texas and Tennessee are enacting new laws that restrict what teachers can say and do in the classroom with their student. The question is, do these restrictions and the pressure educators might feel even in states that haven't yet passed laws like those in Texas and Tennessee pose a threat to our democracy? So let's meet today's guests and see what they have to say. First, we have Tracy Barnett, the experienced history teacher at Hopkins Junior High High School in Fremont, California. Welcome, Tracy. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Also joining us is Corey Brown, and Corey is the principal at Hopkins Junior High, where Tracy teaches. Welcome to Teacher Stories, Corey. Thanks for having us. And also joining us uh, is uh, Jennifer Halver. Jennifer is an associate professor of education at Randolph-Macon College in Ashland, Virginia. And Jennifer has written about how teachers can help students make sense of the misinformation and fake news they often encounter these days in social media and even in mainstream news outlets. Jennifer is also the author of a book we will be, talk we will be talking about titled Young Children's Civic Mindedness, Democratic Living, in learning in an unequal world. Jennifer, welcome. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. All right, let's get started. And before we talk about social studies and history classes, I, I wanna ask our guests about what democracy means to them and whether they like many other Americans, according to the poll I just cited a moment ago, are worried about its future. So Tracy, just very briefly, what does American democracy mean to you and are, and are you worried about it? Um, well, I'm, I'm particularly worried about, I am worried about it because I, I feel like democracy in our country is founded on this for the people, by the people. And I'm very concerned about restrictions on voting rights because um, I feel like that's where the attack, one of the attacks is coming from is it, we can't have a government for the people, by the people if the people can't vote. So that's where I see currently that's sort of where my concern is among yeah. things, but. Yeah, Thank, thanks for the Tracy. Corey, how about you? Yeah, for me, it's the idea that people of different belief systems, different views, different backgrounds, different everything, get a chance to have their voice be heard. That's through voting, but in other ways also, and have a say in what the whole, what is gonna be best for the whole. And um, somehow in some way in general, those different ideas come together to help us make progress moving forward. And I think for a lot of the reasons Tracy just said, um, suppressing some of that vote in different ways is, is um, quite scary. Oh. And uh, thanks, Corey. And Jennifer, you've written a book about democratic living. What does that mean to you? And are you concerned that democratic life as we know it in America is in peril. I am. So for me, democracy is, is associated living, and to borrow De Dewey's term, right? It's, it's how people who come, come across difference and they learn to live together, work together, play together, make decisions together, um, compromise, 
right? And that our society, because it evolves, it's contextual, right? It has to be constituted and reconstituted over and over again. We have to engage it. We have to be vigilant. Um, and it takes practice. Um, it is a practice, right? Democratic living. So I think education has a really powerful role to play there. I'm concerned because we're increasingly polarized and siloed in this country. And we, we've forgotten, I think, how to talk to each other. We don't have a lot of great role models out there for students. Um, and I think civic education has, has fallen down a bit on the job, social studies education, in terms of um, really doing the work of preparing students to, to continue to engage in this practice. Um, thanks, Jennifer. Let's, let's stick with you for just a minute. You, you've written a book, as I mentioned before, about civic mindedness and, and young people. Um, we often think of civics as a as a course or a body of knowledge and that you go to school and at some point, uh, often as early as middle school, maybe earlier, but often in high school, students are taught about civics and it usually has to do with learning about how government works and, and, and the voting process and, and all that. But you talk about civic mindedness. What, what does that mean? And, and why do you think it's important that that be promoted uh, particularly with younger students like the ones that Tracy teaches? So for me, civic mindedness is something we all have, right? It's the way that we orient ourselves to a civic or public space. It's how we how we think about engaging in that space um, and, and the sorts of experiences we have that, that shape that engagement. So we have civic mindedness from the time we're four, five, six years old as we play on the playground and engage with others in the um, in a club, on a sports team, we're learning how to interact with, with others in a public space outside of our sort of private space. So I, civics traditionally, as, as you say, has been sort of this body of knowledge, skills, dispositions, perhaps, um, something that you, you sort of hand to students, that you start to teach them the three um, branches of government, you know, the key landmark Supreme Court cases that they need to know. Um, I argue that we're sort of missing the boat, that civics really is about teaching students how to, how to engage with diverse others, how to live in a pluralistic society. And that, that kind of practice is what should make up civic education. I talk about um, three dimensions of civic mindedness, the interpersonal, intrapersonal, and extrapersonal. That's just sort of a fancy way of saying um, intra in ourselves, having sort of the, a sense of agency um, and trust in ourselves that we, we know what we need to know to engage in the world. Inter is really about trusting others and having relationships and, and feeling responsible for others. And then extra is how we sort of think critically about uh, structures, about um, issues that may come, come to us. And that really it, growing young people's civic mindedness is about attending to all of those pieces of their civic selves. So it goes far beyond teaching them lessons in the three branches of government. It's, it's really about developing um, their civic capabilities. And how might this idea of civic mindedness play out in a history class, like perhaps the one that Tracy teaches? History is the best place. I, I, I'm a history person. I love history. <laughs> I teach it two nights a week here in the, at the adult high school. Um, History is a beautiful place to tackle this. First, I mean, not only are there lessons in history, right, about civics that we can pull forward, but history gives us an opportunity to help students um, analyze different perspectives, look at sources, think critically about what they see there. We can teach them a bit of humility in the face of what they don't know, whether it's people and experiences from long ago or people and experiences right across the street that we may not know very well. Um, but learning how to how to, um, yeah, look at texts critically, um, ask people questions, not presume that we know how they're experiencing the world. All of that could be done in a history class. So I would, any history teacher can do this through content, but every moment in a classroom is an opportunity to practice and teach civic mindedness. I mean, the way we help students resolve problems together in the classroom, the way we help them walk through current events and think through what's going on in the world and, and learn to talk to others about it. Every, every moment is really a chance to practice that, I think. I wanna give Tracy and uh, Corey a chance to make a comment or ask a question of you. And, and then I wanna ask you just one question about uh, fake news and how teachers can deal with that. But um, Tracy, Corey, you have any comments or questions about something, anything that, uh, 
that Jennifer just mentioned? The, one of the good things about history and using it as a, a way to teach sort of this getting other people's viewpoints and understanding the perspective of whatever the writer, the source of whatever you're using is you're able to sit back and think about why these decisions were made. So instead of just, this is what happened. It's like, why did they make this decision? What was going on where they thought this was okay? What, how was it that the, at, at the point of independence, they could, people in America could hold in their heads that Britain was holding them as slaves in slavery by taxing them without representation and they had slaves. How were, what, were, what was going on that was making that a possibility in their heads? So teaching that his, history from that perspective, from what, is, what was going on at the time is just one way of sort of looking at building that sort of understanding about the perspective of where those come from. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, of course, you're building empathy and inclusion within your classroom. So those discussions can happen in a real honest way without kids, without feeling like it's risky. And I was struck by something Jennifer said when she mentioned just in society in general, the silos that we're in right now, that it's hard to get information from the other side or to be open to that. And stepping back a little bit from just the history class what better place than the public school system to get kids out of their silo, whatever their home life or situation or background is and bring them together in a room where they do get to be around kids that are unlike them in many, many different ways and how powerful that is. And then I keep thinking of this civic mindedness. I don't know if I'm inventing a term here, but <laughs> Given some things going on with TikTok challenges at our school this week, there's a cyber mindedness that the kids, they, they care about clicks online. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could move some of that, those civic type things and discussions to be of value to them? Um, I don't know that it, it slightly gets us off a little bit, but all this does connect when you bring kids together in one room. Yeah, Jennifer, a comment on what, what they said? Yeah, no, I mean, I think so, social as a, as a parent of two teenage daughters who also got an email from a principal about TikTok this week, um, you know, th that's also a civic public space where students are engaging, right? It's probably the primary one for them in many, in many ways. So I think as adults, as citizens, as educators, we have a, a responsibility to keep thinking about how to help them navigate that world as well. It's tricky for all of us. So Jennifer, in the world of TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and all the other social media platforms, um, students invariably uh, encounter information that is not accurate. Uh, and it's uh, fake news is not really a new term, but it's sort of culturally uh, prominent concept these days and it's thrown around a lot but um, you've written about what teachers can do to help kids sort of navigate the the world of social media and TikTok world um, can you just share one of your many practical ideas that you offer to teachers about what they can do to help students navigate that world Sure. The chapter that I wrote, uh, Wayne Janell had asked me to write specifically for younger students, so elementary and middle school students, just because it seemed like nobody was really thinking about them as, as, a, as an audience for this kind of work. Um, and so I introduced some really sort of early elementary sorts of things in another podcast that we did, Ken, but I was thinking today for middle school, the ones that are probably more appropriate fit so nicely into the history classroom, right? And it's things that Tracy already mentioned, like identifying author purpose, context, audience, which we would do anyway when we're analyzing historical documents, helping them to sort of think through, um, even in a, in a current day, something that pops up on their phone, right? Who wrote it? Why? Who's it for? Why is it coming to you? Um, what's not coming to you <laughs> and why, right? Following evidence trails. So going beyond that notification to see, well, where did this person get their information? And do, how do we know if this is a reliable source? How do we define a reliable source? Let's look at some different examples and, and see if we can develop some criteria around that. Um, all of those are really important skills for citizens, for historians, 
right, for, for people who want to live in a, in a democratic society. So I think that um, those are the tools to help us pull apart, um, you know, fake versus less fake uh <laughs> news that we might encounter but it's i mean adults are struggling with this too research is telling us that even even young adults and college students are are really having a hard time discerning between advertisements and created news and real news and so i, I these are uh skills we all could could probably develop a bit more myself included yeah and it's you know i worked in teacher education most of my career and it, and and doing the kinds of things you're describing it was not really something that was front and center in terms of our curriculum uh, because it was somewhat less of an issue not that critical thinking wasn't an issue but the preponderance and just um, of of misinformation and and having to sort of wade through it is is so much more um pressing and important today and 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 for people that are already teaching i would think um corey um supporting teachers and offering opportunities for professional learning around the kinds of things that Jennifer is talking about is, is really is really quite important these days, isn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's got to be something. And the, the nice thing is with a lot of the, the new teachers, they've grown up with a lot of this stuff. And so there are, there's courses now where they're coming into teaching with things that didn't exist when we were doing it. And so they come in at least having a knowledge about some of this through the programs. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this topic with like how the fake news is out there. It exists. That's true. But when a seventh or eighth grader comes across it, even if they're using those skills we're talking about to critically identify it as such, then what do they do? What did, and this is the thing that's different than if you were to pick up a newspaper that had a fake article or something that wasn't true in it, where how you comment, what you post, whether you click like or not is going to say something about you. And what is it that you say that then a million people can see what your comment is that was on there in such a public way and maybe even interact with the actual author of the fake news and the, the sort of direction that takes this whole conversation also. And it's whether also there's kind of a moral uh, side to this question of fake news. And that is, even if you have the critical thinking skills to know that something is true or not, you also have to make a choice about whether you're going to um, uh, repost or uh, sign on to a belief that you know that is not true or that is can't be supported with facts. And that's not a critical thinking question or issue, it's a question of character and, and uh, ethics. And, and building upon, but it's, you're building upon that empathy and having kids, having kids come together who do have differences, who are in, di in a different place, both in their learning and in their homes, you know, whatever, a variety, a nice heterogeneous group of kids, um, and building empathy within that group, those kids, helps kids see the impact of what they're doing, even if it's online. Like this is, and, and that is that inclusion piece and building the empathy is so important within the classroom, starting at a very young age, you know, all, all the way through. But having kids see that the, there are people who have feelings behind what they're posting, what they're seeing, what was written, um, I think is, is an important skill that I'm not sure that kids are getting. They, it, it doesn't seem like it. Yeah. I also wanted to point out that fake news has been around, you know, I hate to bring up Washington again, but um, it's been around since the beginning. I mean, there were, Thomas Jefferson had somebody working in the White House who was writing fake news for him. So uh -huh. it, it's been around. It's just not as pervasive and yeah. as it is now. History so. teachers, what are you <laughs> gonna do? <laughs> so, Tracy, I, I wanna, uh, let, let's talk about social studies and your approach to history. And I just you know, wanna remind our audience, you teach people who are just kids who are just becoming adolescents and they're interested in the world of TikTok. And I don't know what are those TikTok stories, 30 seconds long or something. And 
uh, it just says something about what is driving uh, or responsive to kids' attention span, but you're teaching history. How do you do that in a way that engages your students and and uh, and wants them, you know, they wake up and say, I'm, I'm interested in coming back. I want to learn more about history of all things. Uh, well, I think that telling kids that and that you're starting with the why. It's not a what. You're not having to memorize dates and you're not having to memorize the names of battles and generals, which is what they think history is, that you read the book, you memorize the information, and then you take a test. But what we're looking at is ideas and how these ideas evolved over time. What, what, what were the ideas that were going around at the time that people were talking about that led to the decisions that were made? So when you start with that instead of just sort of these facts that you have to memorize, it, kids are interested in solving these problems and looking at these things. They're interested in what would they do? What was going on? You know, what would have the, their position been? Why is their position different than what was going on at the time? So making it something that is not necessarily relatable to what they're going through now, but understanding what people were doing at the time, I think is really helpful in getting kids to make connections and see those problems from the people at the time, the perspective at the time. And I think that, uh, Jennifer, your distinction between teaching civics as a, as a body of knowledge uh, versus civic mindedness it connects with what Tracy is saying, because Tracy, you're interested in having kids get into the minds of historical figures and, and people that lived at a different time, what were they thinking and why did they do that? And that's not always what's done in history. It's not always what's done in civics is to, is to think about the hearts and minds of the people today or, or at, a, at a previous time in our history. Well, when you think about the three branches of government, which is like a classic, right? The, you can't you can't talk about the three branches of government without talking about Montesquieu and without talking about this, what was going on at the time and what English parliament looked like and how there wasn't these separations of power and, and where that comes from. You have to talk about it in that context. Otherwise, it's just something to memorize. Why do we have three branches of government? Because they're, you know, why are they separate powers? Because they are, it's not a good enough answer. You have to understand where that was coming from, because then that gives you something to defend. That gives you something to fight for. So. Uh, Tracy, let me ask you a question that relates to something we've been talking about with other guests in this series. And, and that has to do with what's happening in America around critical race theory and, and, and uh, restrictions on what teachers can talk about. Do you believe and then I'll come to Corey and say and ask you to, what's your thought about this as a school administrator. But do you feel that your obligation as a teacher uh, is to teach history accurately? And do you uh, feel that you can and should talk about uh, racism and systemic racism as, as it exists today and as it existed in our past? Or do you feel that with the pressures, even though we don't have a law that restricts what you can do around that. Um, do, you, do you feel that that's something that you need to downplay? Uh, I, I think it's vitally important to understand the historical reasons for the racism that we have now and tracing that back to um, the introduction of people from Africa into this country and how dehumanizing people into slavery has really impacted what's going on today. And you cannot, for, for the students especially, in order to move forward in our society, we have to understand where that came from. We have to understand without um, putting blame on people because we, again, we have to understand the perspectives at the time and what was going on and how, what what, what the thinking was. Otherwise it, you, you just sort of, you other it, you put it in that other set, you, those other things. And you don't, 
you have to be able to relate to it in order to change what's going on now. So you have to see where it came from in order to change where it's going. I think the facts and teaching the truth are very important and I will always do that um, and do what I teach what the facts show us and what evidence shows us and using primary sources and teaching kids, especially history is not, you know, I mean, to quote Lin-Manuel Miranda, um, it's who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Those are important. It's an important that we are telling the stories of what happened in the past because it does inform so much of what we have going on now. And Corey, as an administrator at, at the school where Tracy teaches history that way, and she is committed to the, uh, the idea of teaching it honestly, and uh, is what's your position as a, a principal? Does it make you nervous? And do you wish that she would tone it down sometimes, or do you support it? No, I, I'm nervous all the time, but it's not because <laughs> of the, the department that she leads here. Um, you know, be, before the school year even started, I had a letter from a concerned parent about critical race theory. And if this happened or that happened, I was going to hear from his lawyer and on and on. And the student hadn't even set foot in class yet with the teacher. And so I try and just stay even. I'm not going to ignore it, but I'm also not going to engage on some crazy level for things that haven't even happened yet. Just like I try and treat it like I would with any other complaint, there are steps to take to it. If, if you have questions or concerns, you start with the teacher. Um, can you tell me, you know, what kind of thing being taught would make that, that would make you feel like something inappropriate is happening? And there's always an avenue for those kinds of things to happen. Um, I want the teachers to know that they're supported. They would never have to meet with a parent on their own. They could always request my presence to be there. A lot of our meetings are happening with parents on Zoom now. And so it's a little bit, it's even easier to have that extra set of eyes. Um, I keep reminding people also that we've done a year and a half of taking our curriculum for every subject into people's homes. Parents have had a chance to sit in the room for a whole school year and hear what is being said um, and taught in the classes. And um, you know, we can set up things like that if, if it's necessary. So, um, you know, I, I just want the teachers to know that if they're teaching history, they're talking about facts, they're talking about things that really happen, they're talking about things that are really happening today, they're not pushing their own personal beliefs on kids, that they're going to be supported in doing that important work. And you know, what I heard you say too, Tracy, is that you're purpose is not to make people feel uncomfortable guilty. Um, and, and some of the laws like in Tennessee say that you know, any teacher that engages in teaching that is intended to make students feel psychological stress or anguish uh, is violating a law, but that's not what you're trying to do. And I can't imagine that you would find any educational value uh, in doing that at all. It, it does um, also, yeah, I'm often the only white person in the room when I'm teaching. So uh, one of the things that I do is go through my family's um, genealogy because the, my, I, I'm a descendant from James Nutt um, who came from Scotland um, in uh, um, 16, I mean, 1716. So I can trace my colonial lineage on my mother's side um, to me. And so they know that those colonists that we're talking about are my ancestors. And when we talk about African-Americans in our country, their ancestors were, have been in the country the same amount of time that my family has. This is not a new immigration phenomenon. And I think that it's important for them to know that, that we're talking about my ancestors. When we talk about white male landowners in New England, those are people that I'm related to. So I'm not ashamed of the history. The history happened. There's nothing, you know, we, we have to acknowledge it and move forward. And um, I, I mean, I just, it's, I guess it's taking responsibility for it. So as a, 
white American with colonialism in my ancestry, I'm taking responsibility for it. So, yeah. and, and that's what we need to do. I mean, the only person who would feel guilty would be me and I don't feel guilty about it, so. Thanks, Tracy. Jen, you have a, a comment about what uh, Corey or Tracy have said? It's, just, it's really nice to hear Tracy talk about her teaching and to hear Corey talk about the way he supports his teachers. You know, Tracy, at one point you said you can't you can't teach the three branches of government without paying attention to Montesquieu. And I thought, oh, sure you can. I've seen it. I've seen it done <laughs> many, many, many times. Um, but the 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 fact that you argue it, you can't and should not, right, is, is such a beautiful argument. I mean, I think contextualizing history is what breathes life into history. Um, Sam Weinberg said one, something that I always keep with me. He said, history has the power to humanize us. And I, I believe that, but it has to be taught in context. So um, I'm just enjoying listening to you. I'll talk about what you do. So I wanna <laughs> switch gears a little bit and ask all of you a, a question that I've been pondering lately. Um, several recent polls have shown that uh, well over half of the members of one of two major political parties in this country believes to this day that the 2020 presidential election was stolen and that Biden is not the rightful uh, leader to be running our country. And, and my question to you, all of you is, what would you do or what have you done if it's come up, if students came into your class and said, I, you know, we're studying history and we're now looking at recent elections I think the election was stolen. Uh, and, and so the question is, what would you do about that as a teacher? How would you respond to that? And Tracy, I'll, I'll start with you. And then um, Corey, I'll ask your thoughts about that. And, and I have a related question for you, Corey. And that is, what would you do if you heard uh, we're observing a teacher and, and, and that teacher was promoting that idea that the election was stolen, what would you do? I'm guessing you haven't encountered that, but I'm just curious to know as an administrator, what do you do? And then we'll come to you, Jennifer, and see what, what your thoughts are about what teachers and administrators, how they might respond. But uh, Tracy, your thoughts? Well, I, I, we live in an, in an interesting time in that the facts are available and we can look and see what occurred and all of the certification that went into the election and all of the the court cases that were presented at the time, and there's absolutely no evidence there was anything untoward with the election. And so we're going with what the facts show us. So because everything is available online, we can look it up and see. I'm not going to say that the student is wrong. I'm going to say, this is what the evidence is. And the evidence does not align with your belief system. So we're gonna be working with the evidence here. And you know, that's that's the position we're taking. Yeah. Corey, do you support that approach? Yeah, I, I think it's very similar to the approach I would take with a teacher that was doing that. Like it would, I, I would still want them to feel supported and know that they're, they're certainly able to have whatever their own personal beliefs are and I'm not going to try and force them to change that, but what we're presenting to students in class is going to be fact-based, and we're going to have um, evidence for that. And you know, there are, I'm sure, plenty of historical examples of elections that have been stolen, or where fraud does exist, or where there's other powers that are at play. But the checks and balances, our court systems, our state systems, all the things came together and said the same thing with this election. And, um, you know, you're gonna have to have some, <laughs> some sort of hard, real, non-fake news evidence, or, um, you know, we're, we're not gonna be presenting that sort of thing to kids as true. And, and Jennifer, how about you? How would you respond as an educator or teacher if you had students who came into your class and held that belief that the election was stolen? Well, I mean, I think Tracy's approach, you know, talking about facts and that we need to substantiate arguments I mean, that falls right in line with the kind of skills we want to teach students. I think the question becomes, what kind of resistance do we encounter from the student? Unfortunately, lots of people are rejecting evidence these days as if it, it's just 
made up, right? It's fake news. And so we get into this argument about, well, I don't believe your evidence. <laughs> um, and so then, you know, students or even adults take a position where they just sort of dig in. And I, so I think I would try to, to step back if I encountered some of that resistance and, and say, what's my what's my pedagogical goal here, right? I mean, if my long-term goal is to help the student develop skills of critical thinking and being able to consider different points of view and, um, and substantiate arguments and things like that, this is probably not the topic I'm gonna begin that work with. I'm gonna find something less, less uh, controversial for the student, something that has a, um, that I can sort of, I'm gonna find an opening where I can wade in something that feels a bit less threatening um, and we're going to start to do the work and build the skills in other places. And hopefully at some point, you know, we have to hope as educators that those skills then will eventually be ones that they can transfer into other parts of their lives. But I would say for me, I would try to know my students well enough to know what battles I should pick right now um, and which ones I should save for a, a later date. Because um, that relationship with my students is, is the most important thing. If I really want them to trust me, um, and to go with me into, into considering some things that might make them uncomfortable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with some softballs. No, Corey, I, it reminds me of a conversation you and I had, and Tracy was there too, uh, several weeks ago when we were talking about these issues offline. But you said something that I thought was, was quite important, and, and you used the same word that Jennifer just used, and that was trust. And uh, I asked you about what advice you would give to young teachers that might be concerned that talking about some of these um, controversial issues and doing what Tracy is very comfortable doing as a tenured veteran teacher, what would you say to a, an untenured beginning teacher whose inclination may be to stay away from all this stuff because they don't want to lose their job or they don't want parents coming in and... Uh, putting pressure on them, but talk a little bit about the importance of developing trust with your students. I think Jennifer really hit it just right there, that, that you start with something that um, isn't controversial, that any kid can talk about, and it's that relationship building in the class that it, it might just be as simple as everybody on the first day of school is going to share their where they get their favorite french fries from it doesn't take right it's not something that's scary or, or puts you out there in a way where you could feel ostracized and I think that trust um, in addition to the trust with the teacher in the class one of the things that I see Tracy do and the new teachers that come in under her there's lots of group work and discussion that happens and it becomes even less of a fearful thing because the kids also care very deeply about how they're perceived by their peers. And so a student that might be coming in from their silo at home where they're constantly being fed only one news channel or their parents are saying, you know, the election was stolen, this and that, and they've never really heard outside of that. When they're in their small group at school and they're hearing other kids talk about it, they're they're maybe going to be more open to listening to those different perspectives and views we talk about. And that comes with trust from each other also. And so those opportunities being built into a classroom would be where I would want to start with my new teachers, just um, helping them understand how to set up. And some of that just might be how you set up your classroom. You can see behind us groups of four where kids can see each other's faces and easily participate in these discussions. Not yeah. COVID right there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just want one final question for all of you before we sign off. And, and, and that is, is it possible to promote civic mindedness, to teach history honestly, to teach critical thinking, to discuss controversial topics with students and do that in a way that is not partisan? Completely. You, I mean, I have my views. It was interesting during the last election cycle, students did not know who I was going to vote for. If you pay attention, I don't tell them, but if you, if they were paying attention to the posters I had up or pins that I would wear or whatever, that would probably be pretty clear who I was going to vote for, but they didn't know. They don't know that what my politics are. They don't know because I don't talk about it. We just talk about what's going on and what different viewpoints are. I sometimes I will tell them, look, in my like January 6th, in my 
what I saw looked a whole lot like an insurrection to me. Um, that is my perspective and I put it that way, but I think that you, you can of course have it in a nonpartisan way. You can have it in a neutral way. I don't think I'm being, you know, I, I'm not being, um, I, I don't think, I think that just if you stick with what the facts are, th that's not a partisan issue. Uh, well, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Yeah, you know, it was interesting in, in recent years, there were uh, debates going on in public, in the social media and on mainstream media about whose facts we're talking about. It's as if uh, reality became uh, completely subjective and you could say whatever you wanted and well those are your facts but but I think what you're talking about and, and Corey what the, the beauty of uh, uh, and the power of public education is that we we all should be agreeing and what happens in schools is that we have to agree on a basic set of facts what happened in history and and then let people make up their minds about what it means and what they believe is the right thing to do going forward. But uh, Jennifer, thoughts about partisanship and whether you can do the kinds of things that you're talking about without being partisan? Yeah, you know, I think all education is political, right? We don't like to admit that, but, I, but it certainly is. I, I talked to my teacher education students about um, a piece of writing from years ago. Are we teaching, um, what, is the, what does teaching look like in democratic versus authoritarian states, right? And when we teach students to critically think and ask questions and consider different perspectives, it's a political choice. It's to prepare them for democracy. We're teaching them it's a democratic education. Um, I think recently, unfortunately, those very things, critical thinking, questioning, multiple perspectives, um, you know, Asking, asking critical questions about history, about, about society today has been made a partisan issue. Um, and, and so it feels that way, which is really unfortunate. For me, um, teaching kids to think that's, that's education in a democratic state. That's what democratic education is. It, it's not a partisan choice, but it is a political choice. And I think we need to, to own that. that. That is what we're doing. We're trying to sustain democracy. I think with, with that, we'll, we'll uh, come to a close. And I just have to say, you, you left me with a, a greater sense of hope about what's possible in schools. And that um, if there is a, a, an opportunity we have to help save our democracy, it can come through the kind of education that all of you uh, have signed on to and are promoting. And, and it's the kind of education that is not only democratic, but it's nonpartisan. And, uh, so I applaud you for what you're doing and, and thank you for giving me and I hope our listeners some hope about the future of our democracy. So I, I wanna thank each of you, Jennifer Hauver and Tracy Barnett and uh, Corey Brown for joining us on Teacher Stories and for sharing your views about our democracy and the role of civics education and teaching of history in our public schools and help protect it. Teacher Story listeners, you will find this in all of our episodes about what schools can do to help save our democracy at teacherstories.org. The audio of your versions of those stories are also available on most podcasting platforms. Thanks for joining us today. Bye, everyone. Thank you.